Hello everyone, we're back with the final round of the 2022 Lebanese Chess Championship Round 9 Who won? Who won? Who won? So, <laughs> you can notice here I didn't spoil the result just yet But I'll spoil it in one second um, So actually uh, Antoine against Joe ended in a draw So we know that Joe didn't win Definitely finished behind uh, Amr, considering the standings. You saw in the end of round eight, at the end of the round uh, eight video. So, who won? Amr won! <laughs> Congrats to Amr, but uh, yeah, it's such a shame they played this uh, basically nothing game. <laughs> Just agreed to withdraw here. Um, yeah, I definitely hate these kinds of draws, but uh, for both players it makes sense. Um, I don't want to justify it too much. I hate these kinds of draws, but hey, blame the game, not the player. <laughs> uh, the game uh, just allows this. Why do we allow these kinds of draws? I don't know. Well, well actually, there are Sofia rules, so at least the Lebanese Chess Championship should, at the very least, employ Sofia rules, but... I'm in favor of abolishing the draw often altogether. <laughs> um, it's it's not present in many games. Chogi, it's not there. It's, it's not m present in many games, so yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, so uh, but but yeah, as I said, it makes sense for both players. Amr clinches the title, and uh, Gio is facing a high-rated opponent who's uh, playing as white and. Uh, is playing phenomenally well so if uh, Gio loses also uh, then he'd get third place and not second and that's a big difference so yeah um, okay so that happened congrats to Amr let's go for the second game this was to be honest maybe even more shocking than uh, uh, than the other game because as he is here if he gets 6.5 um, he would uh, get either second or third, depending on the Geo Amr game, which ended in draw. So he'd get third, um, or at least tied third. Um, so it was kind of surprising to see him play such a state line against the Karo Khan, um, especially against an opponent who he outrates by a lot. Um, now again, definitely Joe was uh, underrated, but uh, like. Uh, as he stands to lose a lot of rating from this encounter. So it's surprising he, here, he went for uh, the Karo Khan. Uh, well, Joe went for the Karo Khan. Uh, and as you guys remember, he's not playing the al as he used to do. Um, I guess he still plays it a bit, but he's been switching to the Karo Khan and other defenses. He's been playing a lot of stuff. So here, uh, d5, and now the exchange Karo Khan. So this is very surprising from Antoine. And as you can see here, this game basically had nothing in it, no content. So just the normal stuff, this is all theory actually. And here Joe goes for bishop takes f3, which I don't like in principle, but it doesn't spoil the draw. <laughs> That's funny to say. Bishop h5 keeping pieces and not trading out the... Giving white the bishop pair was better. But okay, yeah, this doesn't really spoil much. This is just such a calm position. The only chance here maybe was to play rook e1 or queen e2 and kind of keep pieces on the board. Bishop f4 just invites bishop d6 and trading off even more pieces, which is what occurred. Bishop d6. White doesn't trade immediately so as to not develop uh, the black queen. And uh, black doesn't uh, trade so as to not develop the white queen. Even though something like um, taking, taking and queen b8 is possible. Okay, and here black just gets an e5, very smart by Joe, liquidating, and here it's just an opposite colored bishop position, not completely uh, dry, but yeah, there isn't much here, yeah, like, there isn't much. Okay, and here they agreed to withdraw, now Joe in fact could have maybe continued with knight e4, but of course it's nothing, <laughs> so I don't blame him for not continuing. And of course he's happy with the draw as he clinches third as well. Yeah, so uh, we had two very boring games, but hey, this makes my job easier. <laughs>
So now, now let's go for uh, Cersei against uh, Faisal. This was a rather, uh, not really a topsy-turvy game, but um, a game where Faisal was pressing, but messed up a bit, and then eventually he won. So let's see how that happened. So we have the Sicilian and this Queen B6, the um, Godiva variation, right? Yeah, which Faisal has been employing. Knight b3 is the correct theory, as I've mentioned before. Knight f6, if you guys remember, I think it was in the first round, right? Or maybe the second. Where uh, Faisal assayed the Godiva variation against Joseph, I believe. Joseph. So knight f6, knight, B, knight, uh, F3, uh, knight c3, e6, bishop e3. All of this is standard and good, and now bishop d3. Much uh, better here was just a3 preventing knight b4 and bishop b4. But bishop d3 instead, maybe he wanted to go for development. Here bishop b4 with this pin and later some annoyance here was better. Instead he went for d6, locking in the bishop which is actually very strange. Like bishop b4 itself maybe isn't so... Like okay, like the pin maybe doesn't make a lot of sense. Because uh, now you have... Uh, the bishop on d3 defending e4 okay that's reasonable but at the same time you don't want to not play bishop b4 because the alternative is locking in the bishop behind the behind the pawn so okay maybe he wanted to play more calmly and in some sicilian positions actually it's better to keep the bishop here uh, where it defends the weak d6 pawn so okay so d6 and here f4 was actually possible aiming to go for queen f3 g4 and long castles this would have been an aggressive way to uh, punish this uh, slow play by black. But instead, uh, Cersei went for short castles, which is fine as well. Mm, bishop e7. Um, uh, yeah, by the way, like here, castles I labeled as kind of dubious, but of course it's completely fine. I just labeled it as such because it's somewhere between dubious and interesting. And I'm a very aggressive player and I love long castles, so I chose to label it as dubious. It's probably more interesting than dubious, objectively speaking. So anyway, castles short, and here bishop e7, simple development, was much better than what was tried, which was, which was a6. Which seems to be nice in principle, but it allows knight a4 and hello b6 square. I'm not sure what Faisal was going to do against that. Probably some knight d7, but you don't really want your knight to go there where it's slightly passive. Instead, he went for this double clicking mouse. Okay. So he went for f4, b5. All of these moves are standard in the Sicilian. Bishop b7, rook a1, bishop e7. All of these are standard developing moves. King h1, getting out of uh, any checks here. Though perhaps not strictly necessary in this position. Knight b4, trying to gain this bishop and opening up for the queen, opening up for the bishop. Queen g3, attacking this point. g6. Faisal didn't want to castle and go into the attack. So we tried to play it slowly. Bishop d4, making use of the weakness incurred by g6. Um, and now just castles, so kind of strange to combine the two, but okay, still fine. Black always has 98, there aren't really that many big issues. And queen h3 here was an interesting way to try to continue the attack for white. White isn't uh, like winning or anything, or even close, but he is slightly better. e5 is a step in the wrong direction as it cedes control of d5 and uh, allows the black pieces to start swarming through and here we had knight h5 which is interesting trying to uh, attack the queen and uh, go from there instead maybe inserting taking and uh, knight d7 to put pressure on this point with f6 ideas at some point maybe this was better but uh, no knight h5 is completely fine as well here we had queen f2, and now follows a series of very logical moves. Black gets the rook to the queen side, the knight develops to e4, threatening some squares here, uh, threatening this square here, takes, 
and this bishop even though it seems strong and needs to be preserved but Faisal sees that this knight is even stronger and when you get rid of this knight then what remains are these two pieces where there's these two pieces versus these two pieces and these two this piece maybe seems passive and this piece somewhat not, uh, lacking in squares but they're actually both completely fine because this bishop can always come here at a later point and the queen has some nice uh, scope um and the knight has some potential here perhaps with g5 knight f4 so it's not all too bad and also the plan we saw in the game is also fine so rook takes e4 knight g7 relocating to f5 g4 preventing knight f5 seems a bit worrying but there's no light squared bishop and the queen won't do much so it's fine queen c6 making use of this pin king g1 getting out of the pin but kind of going into another weakness which is quite funny because white played king h1 then played king g1 but hey it's what it's what's necessary and here black hat queen d5 preparing a5 so as to meet knight takes a5 with rook a8 because here if you play a5 immediately immediately knight takes a5 would be a tempo on the queenita um yeah so so uh rook c7 um was yeah that, this is this is what faisal played and it's wrong because of rook f4 putting pressure here even though faisal wanted to play king g5 thereby defending f7 but here came rook f3 and the pressure on f7 is basically permanent so he tried to play h5 but now h3 preserving the stronghold on g4 and blocking knight f5 and queen c2 trying to trade off pieces Black should, white should have definitely avoided that by playing here, threatening this and this. Or bishop c5, a nice intermezzo gaining the pawn. Um, at least, uh, well, uh, not gaining the pawn immediately because takes, takes, and the rook moves. You don't win here, of course. But you get a better position because your bishop can relocate here and you get knight d4, knight c5 ideas. Instead, trading queens was too cooperative, and here now he plays bishop c5. Now comes takes, and here, and this position is just more active for uh, for black, and black is uh, black is better, slightly better. And uh, here uh, Faisal played uh, the liberating move with a uh, five. Um, trying to uh, attack the pawn and if the pawn captures then the knight would get active so uh so, so here played takes takes and we saw this line and here the position is already quite dangerous for white because uh, you really need to trade off these active rooks or you just start getting uh, pummeled by losing all of these pawns which is basically what happened so here rook 1 f2 was necessary trying to trade off the rook and this is forced because well okay the rook can move but then you have your own checks and your own play so if takes king takes f2 and then the king will come here and the weaknesses the rook can't come here because of the knight and the weaknesses should be uh, um, uh, they should be defendable instead he played check after king h6 which is seemingly very dangerous but actually it just works out fine rook 1 f3 threatening rook check but now bishop d8 creating the square and actually the king here isn't in any danger rather it's this king that's in danger so g5 check just uh, giving up the pawn but now uh, the king uh, marched forward it's not really necessary to take and enter into these kinds of complications um like here there's this and if after check you go here this is mate so th that's not really necessary um let me add a uh, question mark to this instead king h5 is just good enough and you can come here and you can take later when the yeah sorry about that guys so uh so yeah, I, as I, I was saying here, um, um, so you can take the spawn when the when the opportunity arises. So okay, you want rook f3, rook d5, trying to attack the spawn further. 
Um, here bishop b6 check was probably a better move because after king f1 you have uh, rook d5 also attacking the square but at least here you have this active bishop which threatens some of these ideas and set rook d5 immediately and this allows rook check king takes g5 and now d4 and this uh, bishop isn't coming here anytime soon and you can try to trade off some of these pieces and try to check the opponent but this won't really amount to much now you see that all of these moves, uh, Sorso had some better moves, but uh, okay, he went for this. Um, it's the, like, here the margin margins are so slim, it's probably white losing either way, but uh, Sorso had better ways to defend. Here bishop f4 would have uh, just ended the game, and uh, we can see the difference with bishop g3, because after d6, here for example, the check is met by this tempo and you can't go to d1 so the difference here is that after uh, after bishop f4 after you check after like white plays d6 you can check king g2 and now rook d1 is possible but in this position rook d1 uh, rook b1 check king g2 rook d1 isn't possible because this bishop is attacked so you need to sacrifice the bishop and Faisal probably assessed that this is a win, and he is right, but actually it's not so easy, and you can see that he blunders several times, because the knight is so tricky, of course, and time pressure. So this is all good, but now g5 is a critical blunder. Rook d2 instead pins the knight, and of course this is not something you want to see, because these three pawns are way stronger than the knight and will promote. Instead g5 now allows knight takes b5, Winning the spawn, and after f4, knight c3 is good attacking the rook. Knight uh, knight e4 is questionable because it allows simply a4, and there is no catching the spawn along with these pawns. Instead of knight e4, white should have tried rook uh, d3, and the point is that eventually you'll sacrifice the c3 knight for uh, these two pawns. And you also have the idea, which is similar to what happened in the game, of playing knight e4, knight takes g5, king takes g5, check, king ta uh, rook takes a5. So that was the drawing mechanism, but of course in that position it's still not easy because black has a lot of tricks, but that was a way to try. Instead now came king f5, and here, uh, which was the blunder and allowed the tactic we were talking about, knight takes g5, king takes g5, check. And this is a theoretical draw, it's just a simple Philidor. But actually, eventually we'll see that here Cerso blundered tragically. The way to draw was to play King H2, and here to just go like this, and you're controlling the promotion square. Maybe I went a bit too quickly, so here you go here, and you're attacking the spawn, so it needs to be defended. And then you check, and this square is defended, so you defend it further. It's attacked once, defend once, so you defend it two times, and there's no way the spawn is promoting. And you can also, like, if the king gets too frisky, you can start checking um, and try to uh, win the spawn. And this is just a simple draw. Instead, he went for rook a8, and now the win is what Faisal played. And there's just no stopping. Uh, now this is the Lucina position, there is no stopping the bridge from being built. And here uh, Cerso resigned, actually in this position there is no need to build the bridge because you just promote, so if you keep checking the king just enters. So yeah, tragic uh, loss after uh, Cerso defended rather well, but it was always uh, Faisal who was pressing and Cerso never had an advantage, so fair result to Faisal. Okay, next up we have Samir against Mahdi. Now this was a rather short affair arising out of some symmetrical opening which wasn't symmetrical. Now this uh, move um, isn't so great because you can simply take it. You can simply take and try to hold on the pawn to the pawn with c3, b4 and bishop e3 ideas. And yes, you can actually try to hold on and it's not so bad here. Um, maybe uh, Samer feared queen a5 and trying to recover the pawn with knight a6 and all of that stuff. And this is legitimate, but it turns out that white has a big advantage. Even in some cases, they give up the pawn and retain a solid position in edge. 
that C3 is just too meek. And the reason why is D6 is one move where white should retain advantage because they have uh, like they have the possibility of pushing through E4 here and uh, gaining space that way. So it's D4 versus D6 and D4 is of course better because it's more central. <laughs> it's a central pawn. Um, instead of that, black could have tried to go the symmetric route by taking, taking and pushing through D5. And here black argues that the extra tempo white has in the symmetrical position won't account for much and they're probably right. But this was a way to kind of uh, like uh, make the game way too staid and uh, probably allow a draw especially in this late round, round 9, where many people uh, just want the tournament to end with. So uh, maybe Mahdi wanted to play for more so he played d6. But now comes d takes, d takes, queen and you'd think like this queen trade is a bit meek. But it's the best way to gain advantage as now we have the extra tempo and you can use it to play moves like knight d3 which allow white to apply pressure. Now actually the better way to apply pressure was with the brilliant knight e5. The point is that after knight a6 you have the brilliant knight c4 which threatens knight a5 to attack b7 and then you develop from there going also for knight b5 ideas and this, like, knight, this knight isn't very happy. But you have to see that after knight e5, knight e5, what's the point? Of course you don't go knight c4 even though you probably could, like positionally speaking. But the tactic works, which is knight takes f7, king takes f7, and now rook d1. Um, pinning and winning. e4 is next and there's no stopping that. So black tries to solidify a bit by playing e6, but now comes e4. And black uh, tries to win a pawn, a desperado, but now just takes check and here black will uh, take the, the bishop and try to take the rook but white is in time to play the brilliant e5 which also forces the same kind of thing so let's consider a5 trying to get out of it f takes you just take and it's similar to the line we'll see anyway and here f4 defending e5 the knight captures but now you play knight c3 and yes, white is down a pawn, and there are two passed pawns, and uh, this is an opposite card bishop endgame. Um, but black also has a lot of weaknesses. All of these pieces will start attacking the king, while these three pieces are nowhere near attacking the king, and these pawns will need some time um, to push through, and they'll probably just be picked up. So this is... And note that all of this is basically forced. You can check out this line more slowly. Um, of course, I include the link to the uh, to the link the link to the study in the description. But okay. So the point is that knight d5 um, basically doesn't work anyway. So knight a3, bishop e6. Here knight d5 could have been possible because after rook d1 you just have um, threatening the same kind of things. You just have knight c6 here. Um, so here after uh, knight d5 you didn't have knight c6 because the knight would take but here you have knight d5 because there's no knight on, to take on c6 anyway though Mahdi went for bishop e6 which is reasonable and here knight b5 could have been tried maybe he didn't want to see knight a6 but after knight a6 that means that a6 will never happen so the knight is in fine position maybe he also feared like uh, bishop c4 but you can always play knight e5 to prevent that, or at least knight d2. So, uh, so yeah, that was uh, a possibility. Instead, knight g5 here attacking the bishop. Bishop d5, natural square. Yeah, I don't like knight g5 because you're just enticing the bishop to go to uh, d5, which is a very natural square. Okay, bishop d5, rook d1, again with these spinning ideas, but now simply knight c6 and no more pins for you. Instead here, e4 would have been better because you gain a tempo on the bishop and ask it important questions. Does it want to go here and ruin the pawn structure? Or does it want to go here where the knight has no natural development, developing square? Instead, rook d1, um, knight c6, bishop e3, and now the, the bishop captures takes b6 f3 okay all of these moves are natural no need to really commentate b6 is just protecting c5 f3 is preventing some of these ideas 
And now the blunder of the game, which is quite surprising, but maybe Mahdi was in a bit of a rush to end the tournament. So we played bishop h6 here, which just loses to the following tactic. Whoops. Knight takes f7, and it's gg, and we'll see why in a second. If rook takes d1, which is the natural move, here comes check. And if king g7, this is just protected, so you just take, and you're up a piece. And the knight always has a retreat square, so it's never trapped. And if king f8, of course, rook takes d1 as well. So knight takes f7, bishop takes e3, but now white just wins an exchange. And it's even worse somewhat because there's this now. So uh, um, so white wins an exchange for two minor pieces, of course. But the thing is that the rooks are so active. But after f4, Mahdi resigned because he saw that here you have to give up two pawns to just remain in the game. And so here, this is the only move. But Mahdi resigned, and this was a bit of an early resignation. Again, probably just want to get the tournament over with. Because after c4, the knight takes, of course, attacking and winning the pawn. And here you play b5 and threatening this. So b6 creates, sorry, b5, b5 here creates an escape square. So the knight goes back, you go back. But now the knight captures, and here... Uh, white is up two pawns and has the rook two pawns and the rook against a bishop and a knight so white is definitely better and he's probably close to winning even because the rooks have such active posts and there's this possibility but all is not hopeless there are some threats uh, black can try to activate try to annoy white it's it's a bit early to resign like in many positions white won't be able to convert so by the way, just uh, to mention here, instead of uh, the blunderful bishop h6, there was the possibility to play rook a c8, just keep pieces on the board developed, or h6 to kick away the knight where it probably would have gone to um, h6. So all of these uh, moves were possible, but instead by the blunder, tragic blunder, but it was a late uh, game. I mean the final round game okay and now we have ralph against mahmoud mahmoud going for these typical peered setups but ralph plays some very nice positional chess here here he goes for a really quiet uh, setup against the peers this double clicking is so annoying bishop e2 castles castles and here there was the possibility to go queen d2 <laughs> Perhaps even castling long, yes, that works, even though white played a4, because uh, white is simply uh, very quick on the queen's, on the king's side. But okay, that's a bit crazy, and no need to do that, so... But queen d2 remains flexible, and you can still castle short as well. But okay, he castled. b6, good move, developing the bishop. Knight d2. And now c5. The wrong approach because now just d5 goes into a good Benoni where you have this. Uh, so this is like a Benoni structure. You guys should be familiar with it. We looked at it from Antoine's games, by the way, against Gio and uh, Ahmad. So check out those videos of the previous Lebanese chess championship rounds. And yeah, this is just a common structure and white is so much better. Instead, you should have went for e5 where you try to break in the center and now d5 loses a lot of its strength because you can take and just try to attack it probably the pawn would be quite weak so even d5 against c5 is it's okay anyway he went for c5 and here we'll just see like ralph gains positional uh, uh, gains space and just plays very well positionally so we'll skip through these moves all of these moves were good by ralph here important for example not to take because that would just help black here you avoid the trade and go for this b6 square. Knight d4, you avoid the trade as well. Very good move by Ralph. Playing with space. c3, d5. Trying to open up the position because you're lacking in space. And now knight b5. Black actually had the opportunity to go for a crazy sacrifice starting with d takes e4. After which you'd lose a... A piece but you have very strong pawns which are unassailable basically because of bishop if bishop takes d4 you have knight c5 and it's actually black who's better it's 
so all of this is starting to fall into uh, uh, fall into place for black instead here um, you have to take and play bishop g3 and here white should of course still be better but with these pawns it's rather annoying to play um, two pawns and yeah black should have reasonable chances to hold or maybe even trick black uh, white in some cases said knight b5 but now just knight takes b7 takes oops <laughs> knight b5 knight takes b7 queen takes and here bishop g4 attacking the square threatening this was possible that should have been winning and after e takes e takes and not knight takes e5 but bishop f3 adding more pressure here and wanting to go here and white would have also been way way better no that if knight f6 there is knight takes e5 but here Ralph played knight takes e5 anyway, which helps uh, white uh, black uh, liquidate and trade pieces. Knight d6 is good, trying to get it to an active square. And here Ralph made a mistake of trading this and going for the opposite called bishop endgame, which, uh, or rather a middle game, which uh, actually you'd think favors white, but not so much because black has also uh, reasonable chances to hold the position and we'll see why that is the case in just a moment um, if instead bishop f3 here this he might have been afraid of knight e4 but you can just take up here and uh, taking here is never really a threat um, for various reasons and uh, yeah, so uh, white here is up a pawn. This pawn is weak. You have good control over the center. You have good uh, passed pawns. So this should be much better for white, probably even winning. But bishop takes d6 and you go into this opposite called bishop endgame. Of course, white doesn't risk much here and should be much better, but maybe not completely winning because of, for example, what, uh, what Masarani played here by playing rook f6 and annoying this pawn and you don't really want to play g3 because that's really weakening for example these kinds of ideas okay so anyway um rook e4 rook 6 f7 b4 trying to make use of the past pawns and here comes rook b8 which is a slight inaccuracy queen c7 or actually a mistake queen c7 was much better getting out of all of these uh, queen side shenanigans and attacking the spawn basically forcing uh, g3 after which black will have some counterplay connected with h5 h4 and d3 ideas and all of that good stuff and of course the c4 pawn is hanging so this is uh, this would basically be a fork of course a6 is hanging and d4 can sometimes be one so yeah it's just a lot of liquidation and yeah th this shows why uh, it's easy to falter as white or even play precisely and not be able to win because Yes, opposite called bishop and games uh, middle game positions offer uh, a lot of attacking potential for the side with uh, who's better. In this case, it's white who has more control over the squares in the position. But also, black should always have the ability to draw. So, um, like black should always have uh, the ability to control the the opposite squares. And because of that lack of control by white, yes, sometimes that means that the white light squares. Um, are undefendable by black and defensible by black but uh, that also means on the other hand that white's dark squares are uh, cannot be uh, cannot be well taken care of okay so anyway rook b8 rook a4 now uh, this queen queen c7 fork idea isn't possible okay all of this is reasonable oops White is much better here, probably just winning. But now he blunders with rook a takes a6. b5 was just much better, trying to win uh, this rook, of course, if it's captured. So if uh, rook takes b5, you get to see check. Yeah, so that was about if uh, a takes happens, you win the rook. And if rook takes b5, you get to see this check. And black can only defend like this. And rook takes f8 is just gg. You win a piece. And the pawn isn't going anywhere anytime soon of course it's protected so even that's good and here if d2 trying to take here with the queen you just take the pawn 
because it's about to promote and after this you play the brilliant rook b6 the point being that this again allows uh, uh, the loss of the bishop and otherwise white is doing very well due to this strong passed pawn note that if the um, if the queen captures like let's say takes here you just have this first and you're uh, even mating in this position because here queen takes f8 is mate so um yeah that's that would have happened had uh, ralph not played rook a, rook a takes h6 it takes a6 which just helps black with uh, bishop d4 and now they have some mating threats or at least some drawing chances and all of these threats are in the position so ralph played queen d6 attacking here threatening some of these ideas threatening this defending here Re reasonable move but h4 was probably a bit better because it allows the king to escape from this square though this was also possible so it's not so uh, queen d6 isn't so bad though but queen g1 check king g3 and now ralph basically uh, i mean mahmoud blundered with queen f2 check and i'll return to these lines in a minute but let me just show you the game so king g4 because they're rather long lines so rook g8 okay all of this is known rook g8 is necessary and we'll see why in the line that uh, um, follows actually let me show you the line now so instead of queen f2 check rook g8 first was needed because now if you play rook e5 which we'll see why this is an important idea in just a second um queen f2 check king h2 is just equal because of this repetition and if you want to after queen f2 check to play king g4 now this doesn't work because after h5 check you push up queen g3 check and now of course you don't play this because of this and we'll see why this is losing in the game continuation but bishop g4 is uh, also a possibility giving yourself one more tempo to play this but it doesn't work here because the bishop can capture the rook and here after king h7 you don't have enough firepower rook g7 is just game over you can't uh, draw this and you never have king h6 ideas to mate that's just too slow so after rook g8 rook e5 queen f2 would be a draw and if after rook e5 let's sh show why um, rook g8 is good let's see if rook c8 instead is played here if rook e5 and again the point of rook e5 is to check like this and threaten mate um, so here if queen f2 check king g4 and the same line we're going to see now comes bishop g4 and now if takes you take here and here um, of course you can't take because of the pen so that's not the reason this line is good but because the rook isn't here and you can't play rook g7 now queen e7 check just allows a long line which you win the rook with check and here you have this with forced mate so let me go through that line again a bit slowly so check here and you can't really escape these checks wherever you go i'm going to pick up the rook with check or if you like go here yeah sorry about that guys so i lost uh, power this is what happens in Lebanon but hey i like i just need like five more minutes to finish the video so i'm not going to record some other day just uh, going to finish it now and you can see now with the with the light with the lights i have i actually look uh, like i'm glowing <laughs> it's even better than when <laughs> than uh, when uh, when there was uh, when i had power <laughs> anyway so um, i was explaining this line king g8 queen e6 check and here if uh, like king f8 um, probably just this and uh, or just uh, like after king f8 you can win, win it with check of course and now i can't make moves because i don't have uh, internet but yeah and if uh, this line we were checking so queen d7 you win with check and then you come here and get the mate so that's why rook g8 instead is important and this we kind of see in the game so Mahmoud realizes that and plays rook g8, very good move. Also threatening some of these ideas, so that's another added benefit. And now rook e5 is what uh, uh, Ralph played in the game and this just loses. 
So the gate was perfectly set up to stop rook e5, and Ralph blundered that. Instead, he had c6 and also g3, both would have worked. Let's look at c6. Yeah, I can't really focus on clicking here because, okay, you guys see me like really lighting up your world. <laughs> but uh, the problem is, um, and the light is flickering, that's one problem. But the problem is like I can't really see uh, where I'm clicking on the mouse and all of that. Anyway, so c6, h5, check. King g5, queen g3, check, which is all of this we've seen before. And here, h takes g4. And you have queen d4 check, of course. And if the bishop retreats, now you have the brilliant rook takes g6. Should be given double exclamation, but okay, no internet. So um, rook takes g6. The point is a certain mate. And here you see that after h takes g4, h takes g4. Okay, this is getting annoying with the double king of the mouse. Okay, I'm going to click it one square at a time. So h takes g4. Here you have the brilliant king h5 setting up this mate. So if uh, black plays whatever, then comes... Uh, no, this is uh, not whatever. This is the line. If black plays whatever, okay, seemingly trying to promote, but you just play this, and this is the mate. So this stuff with uh, rook takes g6, king, g king h5 is very brilliant. Very nice mating that. And if black tries to avoid that, now rook h5 check isn't a mate threat. Um, now you have queen g7, uh, queen d7 threatening the g7 square. And after rook g g8 defending, you can just try to promote with c7. And here you're actually threatening queen takes g7 check and then promotion with check. So that would win. So that's why after bishop g4 you're winning. Instead, here, after rook e5, now you're no longer winning because this tactic, as we mentioned, no longer works. As we have seen in this line here, where black should have played instead of uh, queen f2, he should have played rook g8. But now he gets another chance, is able to play rook g8, that makes Ralph fall for rook e5. After h5 check, king g5, king g3, queen g3 check. And now let's look at the mates that follow after king h6 and king f6. So after queen g3, queen g3 check, let's say king h6, here comes queen takes a 4 check, rook g5 blocking, but now bishop g7, and you take here, check, and queen g5 will be mate. You can't escape from these squares, so you have to go to one of these two. King h6 is met by, ah, <laughs> king h6 is met by queen takes g5 mate, and queen, um, King takes h5 is met by queen g5 mate. And if after queen g3 check king f6, also queen takes f4 check, king e6, rook e8 check, king d7, and now rook takes e5. And white is just winning, uh, black is just winning in terms of material. You have an extra rook, these pawns aren't going anywhere. Your queen will, there will probably be another queen on the board. So this is just winning. Not necessarily mating, as I previously mentioned, but yeah, of course, just winning and eventually leading to mate. Instead, Ralph tried the trick with bishop g4, but now simply bishop e5, and it's very similar to the line we looked at. And this is how the game proceeded, and you have nothing. Ralph played on a bit with h takes g4, and here, after queen e3, he tried c6, but now came d2, c7, d1 queen, and queen c5. Here, uh, he didn't take the queen because, well, there are many moves, but queen here is just mate. So, uh, yeah, um, and he tried queen c5. Mm. And yeah, just takes, and uh, here, and you're winning. And of course, you're just losing. So, tough loss for Ralph. He was completely dominating positionally. And uh, yeah, he had the uh, like he was dominating positionally and even outplayed him in the middle game, in the late end game. Even find, found that nice idea um, with rook e5, especially at the end. It was very unfortunate that he found it at the wrong time. And like Mahmoud, like had he played rook g8 immediately, maybe Ralph wouldn't have 
even thought about that rook e5 stuff. Um, actually, it would have ended the draw then, yeah. He would have been forced to go for a draw route. But yeah, like, uh, kind of in a sense, he, he, he got a win out of it because he delayed it. Because then Ralph maybe forgot about it or it wasn't as clear as before. So, uh, and he was like really attracted to this bishop g4 idea, which is really nice of him, like, to spot. But yeah, kind of puts, uh, yeah, kind of puts a black mark on this tournament for Ralph because he was, like, it's still a phenomenal tournament, but losing at the last round like this also from winning position kind of sucks. But of course, overall, it's a brilliant tournament for him and congrats to him. Okay, so uh, with that, we're going to be ending uh, this video. Let me just show you the results, final results after nine rounds. And we can talk about them a bit. So Amr wins with, uh, as you can see here, 7.5. So 7.5. Geo with seven, amazing performance. I wonder what his performance was. Let's check. I don't have internet. <laughs> Okay, Joe with 6.5, um, beating many other players on 6.5 on tiebreak. I think, uh, where is Ralph? Ralph is on 38.5. So Ralph would have been 5th on tiebreaks, but he ended up being 13th. Samir, up and coming player, 6.5, good result for him. Antoine, disappointing, 6 points. Faisal as well, 6.5, like, they still ended up in good places, of course, good spots, but for them it's definitely disappointing. Akram on 6, reasonable to good result for him, but probably wanted more, probably wanted to win it outright. Tari on 6, good result, uh, Khalid on 6, like, reasonable, they're 2,000 rated players. Maddy on 5.5, slightly disappointing, I would say, for someone of his caliber. Adib, definitely quite disappointing. Um, Abdelaziz, Sirso, and uh, Nadim, all reasonable. And yeah, we have all, uh, like, I want to go through all of them. Um, yeah, so um, that's it for this video, guys. Let me again change this we have here and change the window capture to have this even though this was the final round of the 2022 lebanese championship and i hope you enjoyed this coverage i hope it was as exciting for you to follow as it was for me it was all up in the air to the last round a bit of a disappointing last round between the two favorites but hey this is what this and uh yeah, so uh, excellent uh, championship. Um, hopefully the next one will be in better circumstances, both worldwide and in Lebanon. And with that, guys, uh, well, <laughs> first of all, me not having to use artificial lights to light up my room and instead using power as <laughs> most people, well, like almost all people in the world do. So yeah, with that, guys, with a glimmer of hope, I'll uh, bid you adieu. Alright guys, take care and bye.